Grief Stories is not a crisis resource. Please seek support from a qualified professional in your area to meet your unique emotional and medical needs. You're listening to the Grief Stories podcast. I'm your host, Maureen Pollard, a social worker with an interest in helping people find hope and healing when someone they love has died. In each episode, you'll hear a conversation with a guest sharing their story and insights about what can help when you're adapting to loss. At Grief Stories, we're helping grief make sense, one story at a time. Today's guest is Tracy Dunblazer, a Los Angeles-based spiritual empath and shaman, and award-winning author of the book Transformative Grief, an Ancient Ritual of Healing for Modern Times. Tracy, welcome to the Grief Stories podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. So, Tracy, you've written a book about transformative grief, and um, I would like to invite you to talk with us today about kind of what was your motivation for writing that book and a little bit about the journey that you've been on with regards to grief and healing and and how that has come into the world for you. Okay. Well, the first, so the book is called Transformative Grief, an Ancient Ritual of Healing for Modern Times. And transformative grief is the way in which human beings were built in order to transform, transmute, and expand our consciousness. So uh, as an empath, and I, I was I was born ultra sensitive and multi-spirited, which means I had multiple uh, multiple spirits that came with my soul into this life. Um, how somebody who maybe doesn't necessarily understand that or believe in that, you can think of it as uh, as if you had a, a, a several people with you all the time, because I would literally think how they think. And understand what they understood, and some, you know. So we have we have these spiritual imprints that I uh, related to and from. It's how it was my lens on the the greater the greater world, and many of those spirits were deeply traumatized, um, experiencing things like uh, sex sexual trafficking, prostitution, drug addiction, uh, violence, sexual violence. Um, So I I came into this lifetime to really process out thousands of years of that type of experience, of of experiencing trauma. We call it, in in metaphysical world, we call it spiritual trauma. And so I came into life grieving every day. Uh, Some days, you know, as as I got older, I would would, uh, function during the day and cry myself to sleep at night. Uh, I'd wake up with night terrors. I would uh, process all of that on my own because I, it wasn't something that I could communicate with with my parents. We didn't have that kind of a intimate structure in terms of communication. So it was something that I just lived with. And on one level, I I also felt confident and comfortable because I had my posse with me. Um, so it I, I was never alone. I never felt alone in the process. But I did grieve every day uh, until I was fifty on some level. And one of the things that I learned from that process is how profoundly, like when people are, you know, I, there is an experience of burden when somebody carries an emotional burden, it literally is like something that waits on them. And when every time we grieve, we use up a little bit of that, or we release a little bit of that weight. And it really is finite. We come in with a certain amount. And when we're done, it's done. And that's something a lot of people, because grieving can feel so profound and intense and overwhelming, we don't, we don't have, we don't have the the hindsight or the foresight to look at it as something that is finite, that we can process through and complete. So that was one of the things that I wanted to really bring into that concept when people look at grief it is something that is positive purposeful and helpful it chisels us into the beautiful being that we are always becoming right so and so it's that element of our experience that we're processing that we are really integrating into our story exactly and when we have the opportunity and the tools to integrate our grief experiences into our story, then it becomes a part of us and not the only thing we can think about or feel. 
Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And so when you think about the idea of transformative grief and this ancient ritual that you are sharing through this book, what are some of the um, most important elements in, in your perspective? Well, grief, grief, grief is not just about loss. We experience transitions on a daily basis. Our our need and ability to pivot in a situation. Um, the coffee machine broke, and now I have to go out and get coffee because I have to have coffee, right? So you you we have these parameters in our life, and sometimes we are required to pivot from the habits that we've created, and that causes a, an emotional transition, which is grief. And so when you can recognize that and recognize that during your day you could have twenty of those. And that that builds up. So if you will give yourself, you know, uh, a, a five minute inventory at the end of the evening or before you go to bed to really sit and breathe and recognize all the times that you had to transition during your day, give yourself the opportunity to release that energy and to, you know, process how you dealt with it. And maybe if there are things you want to change or or you pat yourself on the back and say, wow, you handled that beautifully. Right. But so, so I call that everyday grief and that's something that's really important. Um, just wanted to let you know, we have a, we have a visitor. This is Charlotte. <laughs> she always likes, she, she hasn't talked to me all morning. She wanted to be here for you. Excellent. Hello, Charlotte. Nice to meet you. Um, so go I ahead. think, I, I think um, a part of what I'm thinking about is that what that feels like to me when I'm as a grief and trauma therapist, when I'm sharing with people the idea of having dedicated grieving time, mm-hmm. you know, yes. where they set aside and make time that that's what their intention is, is to spend time with their feelings of grief, whatever they're grieving. Um, mm-hmm. And it's true, even when we have loss by a death, there are other losses that come along with that, that aren't always as, as um, people aren't always as aware of them. So just like we have to grieve a pivot in our day from the coffee maker to the coffee shop, you know, we're grieving the loss of a person and the, and the role that we played when that person was living here and so on. Right. And so it's that making dedicated time and space to be with those feelings and, and let them move through us in the ways they need to, um, that I talk about pretty regularly. Sounds like that's similar to what you're talking about. Absolutely. In Transformative Grief in the book, I there are 12 chapters and each one of them addresses one of the ways in which we relate to grief, um, death and dying, uh, chronic illness, uh, uh, I don't, the word is not coming to me, but um, when when someone is has an illness and they, and it's, it's fatal. They will die from it. Anticipatory um, grief. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, uh, relationship grief, divorce, right? Uh, siblings, family, familial dynamics. That's, that's a huge grieving point because when we, you know, we, as we grow and develop as, as from young people into adults or from young people into middle age into adult, we, gain particular knowledge or insight into who we are and it doesn't always match what other people give us on in our environment and we have to grieve that we have to recognize what mo- like do we need to keep what we do or maybe we want to you know s- surrender what we do for another idea or thought and so every time you transition into a new way of being you're going to grieve that old thing the other thing one, one of the most important profound and empowered grieving experiences I ever had was when I I had this old Toyota Corolla and it was the first time I'd ever purchased a car all by myself. I'd always paid for my cars, but I'd always had assistance, you know, being at the car lot, blah, blah, blah. This time I did it all by myself. And so when it came time to sell that car, it just needed to go and I needed to get something else. I I refused to let it go and almost held on to it for, I think it was like four or five years. And so when I finally sold that car and the person was driving out of my lot, I burst, I fell to my knees and burst into tears. And then it occurred to me like all of the attachment and connection that I'd had in relationship to that, to having that vehicle, how that vehicle had taken care of me. I wasn't sad to see it go, but I was profoundly touched at what it had walked with me through. 
Mm -hmm. And the piece of your identity that was created when that was your first independent purchase of the car and, and all of those pieces of you that went with it, not just what it offered you. Right. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think when we realize that grief permeates life, that it is just a part of our being that mm-hmm. we are more able to kind of make space, you know, in our minds and our hearts for this reality. And then it's not as scary and it's not as big and intimidating to think about, okay, I'm grieving. I'm grieving. I don't have to be afraid of it. It's just a human experience. Right. I think the the t- two things I think people need to understand about grief is grief. When you grieve for 10 minutes or more, like when you're actively crying, it literally changes the neurons, the the neural uh, circuitry in your brain. You let go literally of, of memories, of certain memories, and you create space in your brain to repopulate uh, new ideas in connection with whatever that dynamic, whatever the thing is that you're grieving. Okay. Um, the other thing, as I started out in this conversation with is gr- there is a a a beginning middle and end to grief when you are heavy in in a wave of grief sometimes people they don't they don't allow those to take place because they feel like they are going to be there forever and you're just not like they're there that just is not ever going to happen you keep going the, the best advice i the best grief advice in 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 when i i think i was uh 30 Somebody gave me some advice about grieving and it has stuck with me all of this time. When the grief comes, call on it, scream it out. You know, it's like raise it up to the heavens, like, you know, embrace it on every level. Because when you do that, you're, you're using it all up and there, and a time will come when, when it's complete. And then, and you will, sometimes I, I, uh, it's kind of uh, when well, well, there's a word. It's like a it's like a bait and switch. It's like all this pain and tumult, and then all of a sudden it, your grief is done. You're like, hey, I'm kind of hungry. Yes. <laughs> let's, yes. let's go catch a movie. You know, all yeah. of a sudden this huge mood switch that almost makes you question what you just experienced. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think I often will tell people that their grief is their grief to carry in their way. And if you have lost a person that was important to you, you may miss them and grieve them your entire life long, but it shifts how you do that, how you carry it, how you move through it. And what you're describing to me feels like the waves of grief that come and wash over you and, and then, and then ebb away. Right. So there's flow and then ebb and, and in that experience of grief, you aren't there all the time forever. Right. And those waves um, in the beginning when grief is raw are often, you know, big and crashing and, and coming fast together. Um, and as time goes on, as you do the work with the grief and feel the feelings and let them flow, then they, they rise up like that less often. Right. Um, and, and somewhat less powerfully sometimes as well over time. And so if you've lost someone when you were 25 and they were really important to you, when you were 75, you may still feel that loss, but it'll be quite a bit different. Mm-hmm. You know, you may still miss them. You still hold that love for them. You've carried them with you all of this time. Um, but that when you talk about the beginning, middle and end, I kind of feel like, um, that that's for each wave more so than the grief altogether, the missing, right? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Well, yes. And that's exactly what I meant. Great. So yeah, you you nailed it. Um, you know, as you, as you're talking, I was literally just speaking with yesterday, one of the, one of the contributors to my book, uh, and to every book that I've written, um, she, uh, lost her son. He died by suicide six years ago. And we were just talking about, like she was saying, you know, for the first time, she doesn't think of him, him every day and burst into tears. And one of the things that we talked about then and we talked about again yesterday was that your grief, when, when somebody has died, and this gets a little bit into the spirituality which in, and mediumship, which is the thing that I I uh, focus on, that's, that's what my life has been about. But when we when somebody's moved into to the spirit world, we 
change our relationship to them. They don't, they don't go away. You know, they really don't, they don't go away. Their spirit is there and we connect with that, but our grief and our mourning process helps us change the way in which we perceive them. It becomes intuitive. It becomes internal ex- instead of external. And we begin to relate differently. So it's, so it, it, grief isn't always about pain. Mm-hmm. Grief is always about change. Yeah. And grief is also always about love. It's mm-hmm. about how do we love this person? How do we love this spirit, this end soul? That is part of our experience. And, you know, when I talk with people as a a therapist, when I talk with people who've experienced a loss, I do a lot of work in traumatic loss primarily. And I talk to them about the idea in physics that energy doesn't die, that it simply transforms. And so what we're doing when someone dies physically is that we're transforming our relationship with them to an energetic one. And so we carry them with us and that connection doesn't die. That love doesn't die. It's transformed because now we have to relate to them in a completely different way. So for example, bereaved parents who've lost a child by any cause, you know, I talk with them about this sense of how do they parent their child now that their child's not physically here to do for and with, right? right? right. They are still a parent. Their child is still their child. And so how do they parent in this world where the, that physical connection has 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 disappeared and they're, they're left to figure out this energetic connection? Mm-hmm. You know, um, so it sounds like um, this is a focus in your in your work, um, as well as your writing, is to introduce that idea to people and to support them in figuring out how to make that continuing bond, that connection with their loved one after Absolutely. their physical death. Yeah, Absolutely. And I, I also want to address, like I deal with a lot of people who who have had bad things happen. You know, and, uh, you know, say, say somebody who's been molested or there's been sexual violence within a family, uh, sometimes love can equal forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Love doesn't always mean the gushy, I love you, love you, you're so great. Love also uh, means that I forgive you and I let go of you completely. Right. And so sometimes if we've had a bad relationship with somebody on any level and then they've left us and they've left us with all this complicated grief. Right. That's what we call it. Um, then you've got to find a way to love yourself enough to find forgiveness for them. Yes. Yeah. Right. So you don't yeah. have to carry everybody who dies. There, there are people you don't ever want to hear from again. <laughs> yes, right. And 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 I think you know that's so important when we're when we're thinking about grief after someone dies specifically. Um, those complicated relationships become sometimes complicated grief. Um, and forgiveness is not about the other person. Forgiveness, in my mind, is about you and how you choose to relate to that relationship. Right. Um, and sometimes forgiveness is. I don't want to carry the responsibility for that pain anymore. I'm going to set it down. And that doesn't mean um, uh, maintaining a connection or letting someone back in um, or being vulnerable to the same kind of hurt again. Um, But what it means is finding peace for yourself, despite this thing that happened that was so distressing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that and that's a that's probably the if we if we had to break it down, that's probably one of the number one grief reasons um, that people experience it. And we and and it's also one that people attach a lot of shame to. Yeah. Because well, it's we 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 kind of hear these stories about deathbed revenge uh, redemptions, right? Where it's like the the idea is that if the person is on their deathbed, they are going to want redemption and they're going to offer it, and. Right. And the reality with humans is that that's not always the case. And sometimes things go horribly sideways in those deathbed moments, um, or they go the way they've always gone in that relationship, which might be horribly sideways as well. Right. Right. You know, 
And so we don't always get a, a happy ending or a closure in a positive way with someone who's harmed us um, and left us with this legacy of pain. Um, right. And so then it becomes kind of our, how do we, how do we transform that for ourselves in our grief? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So it feels like um, this, the what you're sharing in your writing and this book in particular perhaps is this idea that recovery is possible resilience is possible integration is possible that you can take grief and transform it into um to beauty and wellness um and that it's a natural part of our life experience to do it so. is yeah all of those things you just mentioned are expected you know, I, 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 I was born and had a deep understanding, even like I, I, my first spiritual memory is from being in the crib. I was between one and two years old at the time um, and I have actual memory from that time. But a part of me always understood that this burden I carried with me uh, was finite. It came from multiple lifetimes, right? So centuries of experience that I carried with <laughs> to process in this lifetime. And I felt that I was always going to have it, but my spirit said, you must, you must all, that's why I always go, went towards the grief because I, I, part of me didn't, I didn't, I didn't know whether or not it would ever end. And literally there was a day when the last, the last spirit left me and the burden was done. And my lens at that time outside of the grief was so profound mm. that brings that brings uh, up one of the things I talk about in the book um, is that in grief and transformative grief there are three circles of grief. There is the event or the thing that you're grieving. There are uh, the next circle is the choices, thoughts, ideas, and experiences that you have because that thing happened, and then the third circle of grief is the impact of all of that second circle and how, and its legacy. And so when grief is complete, when you complete an actual experience in one situation or dynamic, those are the three circles that you have to process out in order to be complete. Okay. Right? So it also, it feels to me um, a little bit like what we're talking about is a, um, a generational um, burden a trauma or um or grief that is generational in some ways too you speak about it as um bringing spirits with you and that processing of the those experiences so that they were free um if i'm understanding that correctly um uh, no uh, no okay so the so the spirits that i brought with me were related to my soul not to my family okay generationally yes there are absolute cultural difference because the spirits spanned for several thousand years so their relationship to the planet and how they how they, the kind of life they could have mm -hmm. was very different um but all of that is different than ancestral grief right because okay. we definitely have uh like my my mother and her legacy of anger and rage that came from her father from his experiences right he was passed down yes. and i got it that was another thing that I, I could be open to it because I had my own soul pictures or imprints that, that al allowed that to be present for me. But I was aware that in doing that transformative work for myself, it helped to heal my mother and my grandfather. Yes. And I think that's sort of more what I was talking about. So I'm glad we clarified that because I think that's also an important piece is that sometimes the grief that we're carrying or the experiences come through those family lines um, as much as through our soul experience. And um, and that when we when we recognize that, um, when we do the healing work on those pieces, it does heal. I believe it heals backwards in generations before us um but also heals forward too um and and sets that foundation for a much healthier experience of of the coming generations um absolutely what, so, another, uh, another layer i want to add to that is that every individual sits where they are in their community 
and their energy as they personally do their own work, it gives, it sends out an energetic signal to others of permission and support and uh, strategy to do that same work. So everybody there, you know, there is, there's is at least one in every community, usually one in every family, right? Because there's a lot of spiritual trans transmutation that is happening right now because it could not happen in other generations. Yes. And I think, you know, when I think about that, I actually think that grief stories is trying to work in that way, in that there are people willing to share their stories and working through their experiences. Um, and that that becomes then what you talk about in terms of that energy in a community and um, and how that is, um, you know, I want to say spread, but I kind of mean shared or um, available mm -hmm. to Absolutely. others, right? So our conversation available on the airwaves might reach multiple people. And this is just the energy they need, just the information they need for their next steps. And then their next steps offer that energy to the people around them. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, and I think that that's where, you know, we're also all connected, right? Absolutely. Um, so when we realize that grief is a natural normal experience for humans and that we're all connected in it, that we're all more or less walking the same path of these yeah. experiences, even though our experiences are very uniquely individual, whatever we carry in with us and carry through with us. Um, right. You know, uh, we're also, um, we're also part of a whole, a collective. Um, yeah. And so we can, we can learn from one another. We can, um, and we can walk with one another through these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's very powerful when we have those realizations, when we, when we're not, when we are able to release fear of grief. Yeah. The, the other aspect to grief that we don't always talk about is uh, laughter, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, there are times when, when things are so heavy. I mean, I, that luckily I grew up in a family where, you know, we, we did dark humor. That was, that was our thing. Yeah. Um, my father died when I was, uh, uh, 11, I guess. And we, and we would, you know, say he was pushing up daisies. Like did that, like it was immediate. It was, there's never, it's, is that too soon? We don't ask that in my family. Right. Right. And yeah. so, uh, laughter for me is I can cry into a laugh and laugh into a cry. Yeah. Uh, but laughter is another way in which we can process out grief. It, it doesn't always have to be, it, it's not, it's multifaceted. Yeah. That's, I guess what I, that's a more succinct way to say it. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I, I do a lot of work with uh, first responders and folks who work on the front lines of our healthcare and public health and safety systems. And um, and I talk a lot about the development of our senses of humor. And sometimes people look at that and say morbid humor is, you know, inappropriate. But the reality is when we deal with life and death, when we're thinking about these kinds of things, um, there's an element of very seriousness about it and an element of absurdity about it. Um, absolutely. You know, and I mean, I think that's true of the whole human experience, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so humor is this piece that, you know, lifts us and balances that serious, sober, painful side, um, because we have in life, um, I have a friend who calls it the blessings of both, right? Pain and joy. Yeah. We hold the blessings of both as we yes. walk. And so um, to me, that that's why humor is so important is that it gives us a respite from some of that and it's equally valid um uh, as all, all the serious feelings yeah yeah and and i think i think and just just to to preface this here you would never you know make fun of a grieving widow on the day of the funeral <laughs> or you know make fun of like and of course your your yeah. your humor is for yourself yeah right it's not it's not for the sake of others it's not your job mm -hmm. to make help others make light of things unless you're specifically requested to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not about making fun of, it's not about belittling, teasing or putting down. It's really about living with some of the absurdities Yes, in, in my thoughts. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think sometimes um, you know, there are people who aren't ready for that or do, who don't really embrace that. I know my dad passed away 
after uh, some time with an illness. And it was sort of a relief that he was out of suffering. And, um, and as such at the, you know, the wake and the funeral for him, you know, we were kind of relieved um, that he was free of his suffering. And, and we were, you know, and our family uses humor in that way as well. So we were kind of joking. And I know that there, there were some people who were kind of taken aback by that, um, yeah. but they hadn't walked the path with us. You know, right. they, exactly. they, didn't, they didn't have that relationship with him in the end. And the, yeah. the, the knowledge that he wasn't suffering anymore, that, that was, that wasn't their experience. And, uh, and they weren't on the, on the inside of our family where that kind of humor was a big part of our experience anyways. Right. Right. You know? Right. So I think it's, it's so important to make space too, for differences in how we, we do this. Right. You know, Absolutely. Uh, everybody, everybody has their unique feelings, thoughts, experiences, and approaches. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we want to, I think my goal is always to give people permission to do it their way. If it's not hurting anybody else. Right. You know, absolutely. And I think, too, I I just my mother went through about a nine month illness before she died. And I I arrived home after burying her and uh, a good friend of mine who didn't know how to she just was not good at handling these things. She was like uncomfortable. And, you know, I'm just so sorry. And I'm just like, you know what? Here's the thing. I cannot hear another, I'm sorry. I'm not even sorry. I'm I'm actually relieved and happy for her. So what you can do for me is you always make me laugh. So just do the do the crazy stuff that you do. And and we don't even have to talk about my mom. How about that? And she was so relieved, you know, that I just told her, like, like, stop that. Stop trying to say the condolences and all the the traditional things that you think are the right thing to say. And let, you know, she let me tell her what I needed. Or even better yet, in in circumstances, it's okay to say, "Hey, what can, what do you need from me? Yeah. You know, what is the what is the best way for you to be able to move forward in this moment if I'm going to be here with you?" <laughs> yeah, permission and explanation, right? I think I often talk with people about educating the people around them about what they need because people won't know because they're not you, right? No, you Absolutely. know. And so when we, when we are free to tell people authentically, here's who I am in my grief and here's what I need, then it's, it's a better experience for both the person being supported and the people trying to offer support. Right. And and you're not being rude when you do it. No, there's, there's so much attachment to this idea of politeness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you, when you deal with a lot of death, politeness just goes away completely. <laughs> Yes. Right. And, and, and I think, you know, I, I often, um, it's interesting because I'm often very direct in talking about grief and death and pain, um, and, uh, trauma and, um, and it surprises people how we can speak so directly about it sometimes, but at the heart of it, if we are going to move through something, we have to be able to talk directly about it. Right. You know, absolutely. We do. Yeah. It's one of the reasons, you know, that I believe in the power of of sharing stories so much in terms of, you know, how do we move through it? How do we learn? Is, yeah. You know, we share, we learn from others and and we learn from our own trial and error, you know. You know, it's we we all have patterns in the way we speak and we all have turns of phrase, things things that take us from one conversation to another. And oftentimes We are always, if if we move into a place of crisis or emotional crisis, we're always going to revert back to our lowest common denominator and those things that we we did or we said to get us out of the position or condition we're in. And so learning to change those turns of phrases, right? Because we have a lot of them. Well, you always, right? Well, you always, and that can lead nowhere good. Absolutely. Right? And so learning when, especially if you, if you're a family in grief or a group of people in grief, recognizing which turns of phrase you use and practicing new ones when you're not grieving is an, is, is a great opportunity to really shift things for you when you then are in an emotional crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all learning. I mean, our whole time here is learning, right? Mm-hmm. You know. 
uh, we learn something with every breath, I think, is the way that I think of it. And right. so it's that opportunity to shift patterns, to think about what we're doing and why and and what we might need and learn um, and grow and all of those things. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, it feels like this book is just a great resource in terms of anybody who's interested in figuring yeah. out how to move through grief in a way that is integrative and um, and healing. Absolutely. I give a, there are a lot of, um, so there are multi-levels to the book. Uh, there are a lot of anecdotes. Yay. Uh, but most of all, there's a lot of exercises, uh, different things to, to walk through and think, to help you think differently about your grief, to analyze your grief, to look at, to analyze somebody else's grief and better understand where they're at. Um, and then at the end of each chapter, I give you a, a ritual. I'm, I'm a, I'm a fan of ritual. I'm a, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anything uh, in my path. I am everything in my path. And I love, I love, uh, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm not even necessarily a closeted witch, but I love to do rituals. I love to light candles. I love to, to work in that way. And so I've offered everybody a ritual with different herbs, candles, spices, uh, things that you can use as a ritual to walk you through or to help you more deeply uh, deepen your understanding of the topic of the um, of the chapter, and so there's a lot of proactive experiences that you can have, uh, even especially if you're not the one grieving. It's, you know, there there there's this is a manual to to describe all levels of grief, but it also I, I talk about a lot of really difficult topics like homicide mm-hmm. and suicide, and you know helping people to to broaden their understanding of what someone who goes through that their lens how they might look at the world because the more we can understand about the people who go through the the most profoundly difficult things the more we understand about them the more we can heal ourselves from from the judge from our judgment of them Mm -hmm. i think i think that's so important too because i do a lot of work with people who've experienced traumatic loss it's primarily what i do um and that includes uh homicide suicide sudden accidental death workplace death those kinds of ones and and a big part of the pain of those losses is that there are so few people who understand them Yes. Um, and so few people who are able to talk about them readily. And so a resource like this book is going to really be a powerful opportunity for people to learn how to understand some of these experiences in a different way and show up in them differently. Um, and I think that ritual um, for myself is such an important part of just absorbing some of the lessons. The rituals are the opportunity to um, to let that um percolate absolutely yeah. absolutely and you can whatever whatever religious beliefs or findings you have you you incorporate those into the ritual these are mm-hmm. these are non dogmatic rituals whatever yeah. whatever your creator is or whatever you yeah. believe is is how you address the yeah. ritual yeah ritual and ceremony don't have to be attached to any kind of particular philosophy, religion, or otherwise, right? Like it's, it's really about a a sensory um, experience in some ways, and, and then an emotional experience in other ways, right? Um, And so, and so what a beautiful gift this book is to the world. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining me for the Grief Stories podcast today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Grief Stories podcast. I'm your host, Maureen Pollard. Please remember that grief is universal, but every person's experience of grief is unique. While our interviews are intended to help listeners feel validation and reassurance, we realize that these stories may be different from your own. Please visit our website, griefstories.org, for more stories of hope and healing.